Hello and good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to, I think, almost the only uh, pre-performance talk we've done that isn't about a performance and happens out of season. So it's lovely to see so many of you here. Uh, my name, as I think all of you know, um, is Kate Moss, um, and I am the biographer of Chichester Festival Theatre at 50. And joining me on the stage is Daniel Rosenthal, who is the biographer of a very much weightier tome, shall we say, of the National Theatre of 50. And we really, of course, uh, wanted to celebrate the publication of Daniel's book, which was yesterday, um, because we all feel proud, all of us here, that some part of the National Theatre story started here and was part of us as well. Um, so I'm going to start, as you know, in time on a tradition at the beginning, as they always say. Um, Although the National is celebrating its 50th, you know, this month, it has been, last month, the story of the National Theatre, the idea of the National Theatre, was at least 100 years old. So can you just say a little bit about that, where the idea came from, before yes. we talk about your yes. involvement? Yes, I mean, I, I talk about there's the history of the National from the 60s to now, and there is the prehistory of the National, which one can date pretty much to 1848. <laughs> and a publisher called Effingham Wilson uh, publishing a pamphlet called A House for Shakespeare. And this notion that how could the great dramatist of our, of our age, how could there not be a theatre dedicated to him with his works permanently on show and a, a theatre for the people and by the people, that phrase that came into play with, with Chichester was, was in the spirit of Effingham Wilson, this idea that the government should um, uh, contribute, there should be nas a national subscription for this house for Shakespeare. And nothing happened for quite a long time. And you know, it's beyond the scope of this evening's uh, conversation really to go into the whys and wherefores of, of uh, you know, why didn't the British have a national theatre sooner? Is it this idea of a Puritan hangover that we're against um, theatre because of the Puritans? Um, and that certainly we're against public funding for theatre in the late 19th century. We are already by that point funding national galleries, the British Museum, and, and the notion that government responsibility, government funding can go towards that, but surely not towards um, a national theatre. So if we leap from 1848 to the early 1900s... This is good, because we've only got 45 minutes. Absolutely. Yeah, no, no, exactly. this is... <laughs> this, need is like, leap, yeah. this is like the reduced Shakespeare company. We're going to really <laughs> hustle our way through. and and. Really, for me, the, the, and I call one of my, my early chapters in the book, Enter the Founding Fathers. And the Founding Fathers, for me, being Harley Granville Barker and, and William Archer. And Granville Barker, you know, to a lot of historians and, and theatre practitioners, he's this extraordinary tragic hero because he was a man of enormous talent as a writer, as a, drama, as a director, um, and uh, he was a very fine actor in his youth. Some people say he invented the modern concept in British theatre of the director. This notion mm -hmm. that it wasn't just a star who gave the same performance and the other, the other actors were the, were the little satellites in orbit around him. That, that Granville Barker said, no, there has to be one defining personality who pulls the show together and ensures a consistency of, of performance. So Granville Barker was a wonderfully important figure as director, but the dream of his life was to set up and run the National Theatre. And the, the template for what we have on the South Bank was laid down by Granville Barker and Archer in their scheme and estimates mm -hmm. for a National Theatre. And I have, a, I have one of the original blue books at home. It's falling apart. There are only a few hundred published. And it is like touching a sacred text. If you care about the National Theatre, if you hold this pamphlet and you flick through and you look at it in detail and you think, well, pretty much, you could have the rep leaflet for the Nationals current season and look at the scheme and estimates and think those boys knew what they were talking about. <laughs> because 110 years later, the model still works of a, a repertory theatre. Now, the key, key distinction, really, is that Granville Barker and Archer originally envisaged a single proscenium theatre. So it wouldn't have been the glorious uh, scope that somewhere like Chichester has, or indeed the National now has, with three theatres which is something we, we might come back to. But again, they couldn't get the funding. No government would, would fund a national theatre. And the next big leap, therefore, really, is to 
the Second World War and, and the aftermath, and the, funding, the founding rather of, of the Arts Council and the notion of regular state subsidy for the performing arts. And one line of argument, and I think it, it's, it's um, justified, is that the national is part and parcel of the welfare state. Yes, it's the idea the of war. everything of value should be available to everybody who yeah. is a citizen and, and living and working yeah. and, in a place. And, and it, uh, equally, if, if the, um, the scheme and estimates is, is a sacred text of sorts, I was very moved the first time I handled in the National Theatre Archive a copy of the National Theatre Act. The National yes. Theatre is enshrined in statute, as is the NHS. So, you know, the Royal Shakespeare Company and, is not and, enshrined and in statute. 49? 49, yes. 1949. And it's a two-page document. It really doesn't involve a great deal. It simply says the government commits £1 million, which in 1949 was a lot of money. Um, and it's we, still not it's too still, shabby. It's not too shabby, to but it wouldn't, buy, it wouldn't build you a theatre. Um, but the idea was that there's a site on the South Bank and the government commits a million pounds of taxpayers money and and it also it seems to me that's one of the reasons that the national and the bbc are twinned in some respect mm. because and boy do we see it now this notion of um the right wing attacking publicly funded uh culture and the idea that the, the bbc and the national they very often come under attack for similar reasons in similar quarters of the media which is why when Richard Eyre became artistic director of the National in 1988, there was a strong link there because he'd been head of plays mm -hmm. for the BBC and he'd made Tumble Down, this very controversial film about the Falklands. And so Richard Eyre in, in one person was, was kind of, he was a representative, he was a symbol mm -hmm. of, of publicly funded culture. I'm gonna bring you back, we were giggling beforehand because both Daniel and I do, are used to being the interviewer. And here, so I'm going to bring you back to the question, young man, okay. um, which is, having had the, the National Theatre Act, 1949, yes. everybody is saying, we're going to do this. There, are, of course, are people on both sides going, it's not necessary, it yeah. is necessary, how are we going to fund it, where is it going to be cited? Yeah. But essentially, there is still this idea of theatre being valuable and important and something which makes a statement of what Britain with N, capital N for national, mm. is going to be after the war and the mm. rebuilding after the war. So how does it get from uh, being this idea on a piece of paper, these two sides of the paper, to something that is clearly going to happen, such mm. as, therefore, people like Olivier and Peter Hall yeah. starting to hustle around about wanting yeah. that job because they believe it will come true? Well, the, the very austere 1950s, it completely stagnates, the mm -hmm. idea. So the 10 years between the National Theatre Act and um, any, any sense of a movement towards a National Theatre Company being formed, nothing happens. And it, you know, the jokes about the Queen Mother saying, should the National Theatre Foundation Stone have been fitted on casters? Because it kept moving up and down <laughs> the South Bank so often. So the London County Council, the, the predecessor of the Greater London Council, couldn't agree on the site. I've been through files of correspondence of bureaucratic wrangling about it to the extent of, you know, where is the site boundary? And, it, 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 you know, when um, the Foundation Stone was laid in July 1951, nobody really owned, the National didn't own the site yet. I mean, it was a slightly dodgy ceremony. They were terribly worried about <laughs> causing offence to the Crown. If, you know, wait a minute, we've laid a Foundation Stone to a site we don't really own, but this would be very embarrassing. This is, what, this is very familiar to Chichester people. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Um, and really, we have to thank another unsung hero, who is Isaac Hayward, who was the head of the London County Council, and he proposed this local government, central government partnership around about 1959, 60, 61, which really pushes it, pushes it over the edge that, it, that it's going to happen. Meanwhile, of course, what's happening down here is tremendously important. And, and uh, the chapter I have in the book dealing with the events of 1960 to 63 is called A Theatre is to be Built in Chichester, which was the heading of the brochure that Leslie Evershed Martin sent to Olivier when he was at the uh, Algonquin Hotel in New York acting in um, Beckett. And he, it, it's so, so important 
the, the way that Chichester joins the National Theatre movement on one track and the Shakespeare Memorial Theatre evolving into the Royal Shakespeare Company thanks to Peter Hall on another track. And suddenly here is Chichester. And it, and it becomes this rather complicated dance with these enormously powerful and ambitious and talented figures in Peter Hall and Laurence Olivier, you know, jockeying for, for position. And there is no documentary evidence for, for Olivier thinking in exactly these words, but I have inferred very strongly that Olivier saw what Hall was doing in Stratford, and he thought, I cannot be seen to be a free agent. No building. No building, no company under my control while Peter is doing this. He will steal too much of a march. And there's no question that the senior figures in the National Theatre movement saw it as a, as a two-horse race. And there's a wonderful letter from one of them saying, I hope that Olivier will beat Hall in the end. So there was no question that, that they were the two front runners. And it was also, from the government's point of view, this shotgun marriage of Stratford and the Old Vic and the National Theatre movement would give them a three for the price of one National Theatre. And they would suddenly, having committed the money, they suddenly thought, wait a minute, you know, if we merge them all together, then the, the annual subsidy from the Arts Council comes down. And, and I think whatever happened subsequently between Olivier and Hall, and it was a very fraught and difficult relationship, mm. I really think that the landscape that we all enjoy as theatre-goers of Chichester and the RSC and the National owes a great deal to Evershed Martin, but it's really, it, it's Hall and um, Olivier. And I, I say it's the, it's the happy collision of the um, uh, irresistible force in Olivier and the immovable object in Peter Hall. <laughs> and that's, that's tremendously important. Yeah. And, you know, we're 50 years on. I think it's wonderful that Chichester's 50th and its redevelopment, the National's 50th and its redevelopment, the RSC's 50th and its redevelopment, those three cornerstones of uh, subsidised theatre in this country. You know, that 1961 to 63, those are the two years, two to, mm -hmm. two to three years, where if you want to understand what we have now, read about uh, and study what happened in those three years. And of course, the, the complete difference about the way that the projects were taking shape, because one of the things that most, uh, uh, most of us who are from here, either by birth or adoption feel, is that sense of Evershed Martin sending that letter extraordinarily being answered with the, yeah. yes, of course I will come, Lord Olivier says, to not Lord then, to, to Chichester. Yeah. And, but the idea that it was built for the community, by the community, there wasn't public funding. Mm. And of course, one of the things when I was researching, and, you, and you, you put all of this in here, of course, as well, was that sense of those two years, essentially, of co-productions between yeah. Chichester and the National. Um, where the things that were subsequently to become so important, the Othello, Royal Hunt of the Sun, um, were here. Mm. Um, now, once the battle between Hall and Olivier had happened, in the first instance, there was this terrible bit of timing, wasn't there, that Olivier was announced that he would be the first director of the National Theatre at the opening here. Yeah. So there was already that sort of shifting sands. Do you feel that... Um, it was inevitable that Peter Hall would be Olivier's successor, that when Olivier stepped down through ill health and uh, overwork, mm. that it would always have been Hall? Or do you think there was a moment at which they could have decided in, in 75, 76, when it was going to open, yeah. that it could have been a different sort of person? It could certainly have been a different person in, in two directions. Number one is, it, I, look, the, the what-ifs of, of history are often more fascinating than the, the actually what happened. So two what-ifs. The first is to do with Peter Hall's own attitude to running Stratford. And he felt burned out in 1967, and he said, I'm going. He told the, the, the Council of Management, their board, please appoint Trevor Nunn. And, and Peter just went. But Trevor Nunn has always maintained that the idea was that he saw himself as a placeholder that Peter would recharge his batteries and come back. And if he'd come back and found more of a, a, a happier balance between administration and directing, it wasn't so exhausting and, uh, um, and demanding, might, he might have stayed at Stratford quite happily, gone off to direct opera, gone off to direct films whilst running Stratford, 
and might not have been in line in 71, 72 for the national job. Secondly, when he took on the joint running of Covent Garden with Colin Davis, and then found that the board of, of Covent Garden was... At the, the Opera House. At the Opera House, yeah. was very, very um, resistant to the changes that Hall and Davies wanted to make. And Peter quit. You know, he, he, left the, he left Colin Davies in the lurch to the extent that uh, when Colin Davies, sadly no longer with us, when I wrote to him to say, would you talk about this episode in your career at, at Covent Garden for my book, he declined, and he had earlier referred in another interview to the sad story of Peter Hall. Some people argue that Colin Davies's regime at the Royal Opera House didn't recover from losing Peter, and Peter frankly admitted that he behaved badly. He had to get out because he'd made the wrong decision. What that meant was that he was on the open market again. Now, it has always been denied by Peter, and, and John Tooley, who was the general director of the Royal Opera House at the time, said, there would have been no, nothing surprising if Peter thought, I can't be tied to Covent Garden mm. because then I won't be in line for the national. So those are the what-ifs for Peter's eligibility. The what-ifs from Olivier failing to appoint a successor are much more to do with Olivier's own personality. Because he and didn't really want to have to go. He neither, and Joan Plowright talks about this, Frank Dunlop, the director who was terribly close to Olivier, talks about this, Michael Blakemore talks about this. He both did not want Peter Hall to get the job, but he did not acknowledge his own fading powers and the fact that, you know, the, the RSC-NT rivalry that had existed throughout the 60s, that he, he, he couldn't bring himself to see Peter in those terms. And that succession, which I, I describe it in the book in one of the, the diaried sections, because I found the week by week, month by month process of who's going to get the job. And, and Olivier would either clutch at straws, he would either suggest to uh, Max Rain, the chairman of the National Theatre Board, let's appoint David William. Now, David William was a perfectly competent actor, director, manager. He'd run Regent's Park Theatre, he worked with distinction in, in Canada subsequently. But um, Frank Dunlop said, oh, David William, that was Larry's thought of the day. This wasn't a proper succession process, such as Kate has just been involved with at, at, at the National. This was clutching at straws. And therefore, that's one of the reasons that Max Rain and Arnold Goodman in his last major act as chairman of the Arts Council that they, they took the law into their own hands. Now, it was seen as, as betrayal of a high order, of treason of a high order by the Olivier loyalists. But even the people who, who resented the way it happened acknowledged that if you were going to pick someone with the experience and the cussedness and the hunger and the ambition to manage that transition from the Old Vic to the three theatre operation on the South Bank, mm. you had to go to Peter, that he was the leading candidate. So the, what most people agree on is it wasn't that they picked the wrong person, it was the how it yes. was done. Because you, you have um, many wonderful anecdotal scenes in the book, um, but there's one particular one when uh, Olivier is there, of course, with his wife, Joan Plowright, Michael Burton is there, Elizabeth Taylor, Mia Farrow with her then husband, Andre Previn, and, uh, or Andrew Preview, as of course we all know him. And, um, and Olivier essentially says to Burton, what, you know, he has had this private conversation saying, why don't, why don't you do it? And he yeah. believes it's in his gift. Yeah. So then starts to try to recruit people. And there's this gut, you can hear the sort of the tumbleweed <laughs> almost going along the dinner yeah. table. At, that, at the second meeting where Burton suddenly thinks, well, you mean I'd have to apply and, and, and there would be interviews. And, you know, it, it wasn't just... So you see the world changing, don't you, you do. in, in a way between you that do. sort of... Uh, sort of droit de signeur type thing yeah. in the 50s and 60s to yeah. the way that publicly funded theatre is going to work going forward. Absolutely. And I think the other, the other thing that makes Olivier's not leading the company into the South Bank more poignant for me was, I think I'm right to say, that I, I have drawn more attention than previous accounts of the National to the, to the very strong links between the National and the Young Vic when the Young Vic started in 1970, it was purely and simply an offshoot of the National Theatre. 
And what that meant was that for a couple of brief moments in the winter of 1970, Olivier was responsible for three theatres. Mm. You know, there was, the, there was the Cambridge Theatre season of the National Theatre Company, there was the Old Vic, and there was the Young Vic. So there was a three-theatre operation. Yeah. And you can't tell me that Olivier didn't look at that as the shape of things to come when I'm running the South Bank. Mm. And that's heartbreaking yeah. for him. And, and you've got one of the photographs that um, is better known maybe than others, um, but the, the moment at which Peter Hall is greeting the Queen and has bowed terribly low and just slightly out of shot is Lord Olivier standing there. And I think that is a very poignant picture as well, sort of the new guard and the, and and the, the old, old guard. guard. Yes. And, and the, the attempts that the correspondence files are full of Peter Hall writing to Olivier saying, please come and direct this show, please come and act in, in this show. He would have let him name any play or part because politically, and it was both a political act on Peter Hall's part, I would argue, and an act of fraternity and loyalty and love. John Goodwin, who was Peter Hall's head of press in Stratford and then at the National throughout Peter's 15-year tenure. He is, as I call him, the most loyal of the Hall loyalists. <laughs> and John pointed out something very interesting, which is that when Peter Hall continues offering Olivier leading roles, even though he's physically too frail, and it, John Goodwin suggests that Peter may have carried on doing it, knowing there was no hope, as an act of kindness to an old friend and colleague. You know, they were friends, there was friendship. And Peter talks of the period from Peter's appointment in 72 through to the opening of the, of the building in uh, 76 as one of the nastiest periods of, in his life because he says his friendship with Olivier went. And what goes around comes around because what Peter says then is, I understand it completely. This is Peter looking back from the late 90s to the early 70s and saying, I understand it completely. None of us likes giving up. And that was mm. the position that mm. Peter him found himself in at the National. Mm. He completely chose his anointed successor, as Olivier had failed to do, in that Peter anointed Richard Eyre. But, and it's very appropriate, the set of King Lear that we're on now, because Richard <laughs> ended up feeling like Goneril or Regan, because Peter had said, look, clearly you're going to inherit the kingdom from me. But when he finally got it, Richard was going to go, and in good time you gave it, because yeah. he had been made to wait and wait and wait. Mm. And when is Peter going to go? When is Peter going to go? Another of these what-ifs. And in his book, Richard Eyre's book, I'm sure many of you have read about his time there called National Service, which I think is a wonderful uh, account of his, his time. He said, you know, that he spent a lot of time with all the responsibility, but no power. Yeah. Um, that, that sort of strange... And, and I would say that, as, as you know, the, those of us involved in the more recent choice, um, a lot of those things, everybody's learned a lot from that, that you need to be clear about where the responsibility yeah. and the power lies for something that is an employment for hundreds and hundreds yeah. of people. It's not just the two people at the top, is it? No. It's everybody else. And, and, you know, institutions are enormously complicated if they're of the size of something like the National. And if you factor in that they are produced, they're not producing uh, motor cars, they're not producing computers where it's an identikit product mm. coming off the production mm. line. That so either works or doesn't. That either <laughs> works or doesn't, exactly. Mm. It, the, the sense in which, it, you know, uh, Tynan describes the National as the play factory at one point. And, but they're all so different. So the complexity of those institutions means that they take time to evolve. And the successions, each succession, I think you could argue, has been better managed than the previous one mm. because everybody learns. You know, if you produce a book once a year, you only get one chance to get it right. If you produce a monthly magazine, you get 12 chances. I and mean, you can see where I'm going with this. But if you, if you manage a succession at the National Theatre once every 5, 10, 15 years, there's a long time to learn the lessons of, of what did or didn't go right. And it's so striking with the last two successions at the National that when it, uh, the one before that, uh, Richard Eyre to Trevor Nunn, the succession was in October of 97, which meant that Richard and Trevor shared equally the responsibility for that financial year 
And I don't think that was a good decision <laughs> because subsequently they said, no, the break is um, the end of the financial year. And then the responsibility is absolutely mm. clearly mm. the last year of one director, the first year of the next. And so th the model of an 18 month handover with the director designate in post for 18 months to plan his or her opening seasons and the break with the financial year, you can just see these little incremental improvements in the way the successions mm. have been handled because they're very complicated processes. They, they, they are. Now, what I think it's very clear to everybody that, you know, Daniel's been working and researching and writing this book for nine years, so everything you need to know is there. So I'm not going to ask you to talk about every single director in turn because we will run out of time. Yeah. Um, but I am going to ask, um, I suppose you were a journalist, you're very involved with the National Theatre, you do a lot of platforms, we, we do some of those similar things. You're a, a, a professor and a teacher of, of this area. What was it that made you want to dedicate nine years of your life to this? And what have been the surprises? I didn't know it was going to be nine years. I would say that. I thought it would be considerably less, as did my publishers. Publisher is over and here, God ladies bless and gentlemen. Them, God bless them for their, for yeah. their patience. Um, but I felt that um, it needed to be written. The book needed to be written. And I hope that comes across in the way I want it to, which is that The National had not had a third-party history written since around 1989-90, book by Peter Lewis, theatre critic for the Mail for many years, called The National, A Dream Made Concrete. But his <laughs> account ends pretty much when Richard Eyre starts. So when I was first proposing the book, um, Trevor Nunn had just, you know, Nick Heitner had been announced as the next director and was going to take over. And so there was already um, another 15 years or so of, of history. And it's ended up with much more than that. So the reason I wanted to do it was because I felt it ought to be written. But and you must have loved the National. Oh, no, I mean, absolutely. Do you have a I memory mean, of your I, first time there? My or? first time there yeah. was seeing Hiawatha, um, Michael Bogdanov's adaptation of the, of the Longfellow poem. And I had this extraordinary, extraordinarily moving moment in the National Theatre Archive because I was checking the repertory leaflet for uh, about January, February 1980. And I wasn't looking for Hiawatha, I was looking for something else, but I suddenly saw that on Saturday mornings, uh, when Hiawatha was on, they did two matinees, which is a brilliant idea. They did an 11 o'clock and a 2 o'clock. And I just had this flash moment back to that being my first visit to the National, which I knew it had been a Saturday, but I suddenly went, no, we went before lunch. We just got up, had breakfast, and went to the theatre. And I was nine. And when you're nine, I mean, look, when you're uh, any age and any height, the Olivier Circle is a long way up. But when you're nine and looking down from the Olivier yeah. Circle, it's a very long way up. And I don't remember a great deal about the show, but in my loft, I have the programme. And I remember absolutely vividly um, Pravda, Anthony Hopkins in Pravda, because I was 14 then. And it was the first new play that I had seen. And that, abs I was old enough then to understand, hang on, this has just been written. This isn't an by old- By a living writer. By a living writer. <laughs> and it's about stuff that I've seen on the TV news. So I was 14 when I saw that. I mean, so many individual um, memories. But the real motivation was working, writing about The National as a freelance journalist for The Times or The Independent. You know, it was great. I had, it was incredibly privileged to interview people like Nicholas Heitner, Howard Davies, actors like Ken Grant, Cr Ken Cranham, Julian Glover. But those conversations get distilled down to the best thousand words or 1,200 word story that you can muster. And then that's it. And same with, 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 with a platform talk, you know, 45 minutes. You can cover a certain amount of ground, but not, not the whole story. So those, those two things came, came together, really, this sense of I absolutely love writing about The National. Maybe I could do it at book length. And I looked at what the existing volumes were like. And the final piece of the puzzle, so to speak, was establishing that I wanted to do it with full access to The National's archives, which had, been, had not been able, open to Peter Lewis or to John Elsom and Nicholas Tomlin in the 70s. 
That was the key. If it was going to be uh, interviews and press cuttings only, I wouldn't have done it. So we really, this, I owe a great debt both to um, Nicholas Heitner, but particularly to Sir Christopher Hogg, who was chairman of the National at the time the book was getting off the ground. And it was, in his, uh, it was up to him to say whether or not I would be entitled to look at the restricted series of papers and documents and correspondence in the National Theatre Archive. And because I was judged, as it were, a fit and proper person for this job, that really was the, the, the turning point. It was, both, it was the deal breaker in both directions, if you see what I'm getting at, that, that the National, as it were, were putting their faith in me by letting me have that mm. access. But if they'd said um, no, then I wouldn't have carried on with the proposal for the book, mm. and I would have done something else with my 30s rather than writing this book. Were you worried that you would find things that, how should I put it, to, would take the shine off some of the women and men that you most admired because you would be seeing the behind the scenes horse trading and things that uh, went on? No, I mean, I, I don't think I idolise anybody in theatre. I admire enormously people in theatre, but they are, the, the people I've interviewed uh, over the years are, um, I have professional relationships with them. They're not my friends. I'm not a full-time drama critic. And somebody I was interviewing, a senior board figure, said, no, that's very important that a theatre mm. critic isn't writing this book because that critic necessarily would slightly be held hostage to their own verdicts on national theatre shows if they had attacked a show that was otherwise, had otherwise got rave reviews or vice versa. So there is this phrase, you know, I come with clean hands. I came to the project with clean hands, <laughs> no agendas, no axe to grind in any direction. And actually, my, my admiration for um, writers and, and directors particularly has gone up because of the correspondence that I've seen. Because what you see from the correspondence, and it's why I quote from it so often directly in the book, is you see the passionate commitment that these artists, these practitioners have for their work. And it's another reason why mm. I spend so much of the book on new writing, because, you know, David Hare and Richard Eyre, Peter Schaffer and John Dexter, Peter Schaffer and Peter Hall, Harold Pinter and Peter Hall, these are the relationships that have defined our theatre for the last mm. 50 years. And Tony Kushner, wonderful writer of Angels in America, said, it's, it's the most complicated relationship in theatre, the writer-director relationship. And Tony Kushner said, and not just because I'm crazy, that it is always complicated because you've got these two very determined um, creative personalities. If they work in harmony, wonderful. If they're at odds, not. And you know, the crude example I would use is that Nicholas Heitner doesn't have Anton Chekhov banging on his door saying, why aren't you putting on my new play? Or you're putting it on, but it's in the wrong theater. <laughs> or you're putting it on, but you've got the wrong lead actor. Whereas those conversations with a David Hare, um, with a Peter Nichols, are absolutely mm -hmm. part and parcel of the artistic director's life. The thing that I, I when I was researching for the Chichester book, which is a very different sort of book um, from yours, but I think, it was the element of chance that I found so extraordinary because when you sit in the audience, you're seeing what is, what is, what is going to happen. And you might like it and you might not. Um, but when I was researching, you know, to discover things like the Italian straw hat, which was my first memory of theatre here, only went on because something else fell out and it was on in the last minute and all the stage crew were actually painting the back wall of the theatre or an amazing piece of community uh, play, the Barchester Chronicles, which had the production values of the best piece of theatre you'd ever seen, but you take it all for granted because you assume yeah. it's always like that and you discover that there'd never quite been a community play of that calibre. And it was that sort of thing for me to discover the chance and the finger up to the wind and the yeah. spinning on a sixpence that is endemic in theatre. And is. you must have found the oh, well, same. And, I mean, I suppose the ultimate example of that for the National is Stephen Daldry's revival of An Inspector Calls, which goes on to become the most successful revival of a play in, in British theatre history. You know, it still goes out on tour 20 years after it was, it was first done. And Richard Eyre and his executive director, Janista McIntosh, wanted to kill it because it was costing too much. It had this absolutely glorious set. Some of you will know the, the show. Glorious set by Ian McNeil, this out-of-scale doll's house of a home for the Burling family. 
upstage, which, which opens out to reveal them in all their finery at dinner. Mm. And then when, when their illusion of security, when the inspector has done his work, um, it collapses. There, was, uh, there are rain showers. There were lots of extras shuffling on as, as, as um, people have been bombed out in the, in the blitz, as it were. And the cost went up and up and up, and the budget was exceeded by this 10,000, another 10,000. And Jenny McIntosh went into Richard's office and said, we'll kill it. We won't put it on. We can play um, the madness of George III, uh, madness of King George, for another, uh, an, another few uh, performances. We will kill it. And then they went, we can't kill it. Precisely because it was such a, a stalwart of regional repertory theatre, it was a touring production. So it was already booked to go from the National out on tour. And if they killed it, the heads of those theatres would have rung up and said, um, you know, we now don't have a show for this fortnight in our autumn mm -hmm. programme. Mm -hmm. And the lawyers would have got involved. And the and Arts Council... And it's the Council responsibility of the National Theatre, the trickle down tour. and... Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so they suddenly thought, we can't kill it. It goes ahead with, with a budget overspend, I think, of around £50,000. And it subsequently makes, in profit for the National, more than 500000 You know, it runs and runs and mm. runs. It made Stephen Daldry's fortune. It made Ian McNeil's fortune. It's a much-loved show. It transformed um, a generation of, of students' attitude to that play. I was lucky enough to interview Thomas Priestley, J.P. Priestley's son, and he said, you know, the transformation in attitudes mm. to my father's work because of that play. So that's a, a textbook example of... What, what might have been. And for me, it was, it was going through the planning notes and seeing, you know, I came to it as, yes, as a theatre journalist, but also at heart as a theatre goer. And the fact that when I go to the National, when I used to go to the National, there would always be that thing, well, you know, I'm seeing this show, but you don't know that it might have been three other shows or the director who took it on was the fourth director mm. to whom it was offered and the lead actor was the third you know, those, those combinations of happenstance. And it's why I choose as one of the epigraphs for the book a remark of Trevor Nunn's to me, which based on his experience running both the RSC and the National, he said to me, the history of a producing theatre is not what it wanted to do, but what it did. <laughs> and that absolutely nails what Kate has just been, has just been suggesting, that, you know, you can, you can plan, but people aren't available. The correspondence files are filled with actors turning down uh, parts, and then the directors go back to the drawing board. And air traffic control, I think, is quite a good image for how repertory planning works at the National. It's air traffic control when you have got a fixed season in place. You have to decide, well, this show needs to land in the Littleton on this date, in the Cottesloe on that date, the Olivier on that date, and the others are circling in the air in the workshops and the <laughs> rehearsal rooms waiting to come in. But it's also um, air traffic control because you actually think, well, you know, which route are we going to go? And you don't, you don't know who's going to be ready when. You have to have a plan B because what if this wonderful young playwright that you've commissioned is delivering a good uh, piece of work, but the, sev the seventh draft that you thought was going to be the production draft isn't ready. And that's when you suddenly think, we need... And they give them... Uh, they give the slots in repertoire planning at the National. You will have L12345 for Littleton12345, O12345, etc. for the Olivier. And you see these little references from Nick, Nick Starr or Nicholas Heitner saying, you know, we need a new O5 because such and such has fallen through. Mm. L5 moves back a month. What they often love is if L5, and there, were, there was going to be a sixth show, if the fifth show, the financial year, does better than they budgeted, then you can extend it yeah. and you save, let's say, £100,000 and you push that uh, into a production for the, for the following year. Or when something wonderful, um, miraculous happens, like London Road, which is mm. a, a play that on paper looked very unpromising, sort of uh, uh, verbatim reports of the real people who lived in the same road as the serial killer in Ipswich who killed all the prostitutes. And it's a sung play, mm. really. And of course, it was in the Cottesloe that will be the Dorfman, and then it was so successful. Yeah. Suddenly, then that is coming into yeah. one of the bigger houses. Yeah. Um, I, I do want to give uh, the audience a chance to ask some questions in a moment, but just a rather cheesy question, but it gives me the chance to say my favorite anecdote. Okay. <laughs> um, 
the book is full of letters. It's full of it, not you. You've resisted the email in the recent time, but letters of folders of all the planning you're saying of A, B, and C. If these actors um, verbatim reports, bit of newspapering. There's also wonderful anecdotes and dialogue anecdotes. And one of the ones that I loved was a very young. Michael Gambon, never done any acting, didn't know anything about theatre, uh, so went into audition in front of Olivier, not knowing that he was doing one of Olivier's great parts in Richard. Yeah. And you have Olivier, you know, the, the, the dialogue between going, we've got a bit of a cheek, yeah. haven't you? So that, there were so many like that. Can you just pick out a couple of anecdotes that you particularly <sighs> cherished when I you think, came across I them? think you, because, because truth, truth is often stranger than fiction, the story of Way Upstream, of Alan Akebourne's play at the National in 1982 about a riverboat holiday that goes terribly wrong, and the production went terribly wrong. You know, it was a, a water tank on the Littleton stage, a family cruiser, a ship that they, they, they put in there, a riverboat, and the tank leaked, and everything that could possibly go wrong uh, did go wrong. There's this fantastic letter. They were a bit concerned about, well, what happens to the water when, when you know, it's, it's stored overnight and there's two or three performances? And, you know, what if the actors fall into the water? Do you think we should get the water checked out? So the production manager sends a sample of the water to St Thomas's Hospital, which is very conveniently near the National Theatre. And a letter comes back from the professor of microbiology saying that the water is host to a rather eclectic cast of organisms. And he says, you know, this, never mind the smell, I wouldn't like much swimming in the stuff. And so the tank has to be treated with pool disinfectant. I mean, things, go, absolutely everything goes wrong. And then... The show closes and they can finally move on and put in the insurance claims. And John Goodwin, who always had an eye to the main chance on publicity and to raise money for the National as, as head of press of the National, he puts a story in the Evening Standard Londoner's diary and he says that the hull of this cruiser, which, which was obviously not seaworthy, but it could easily be, me, be made seaworthy and it's going cheap. And they put it on the market, this giant prop <laughs> from the National at £2,000. This is in 1983. And nobody, nobody comes and buys it. So what are they going to do with it? Well, wonderful donation, charity. They give this cruiser hull to a local primary school. And you think, at last, a happy ending to this terribly sorry saga of way upstream. Except that the little darlings vandalised it so badly that it was taken away from them. So even at the very end, way upstream was, you know, cursed right through to the last moment. <laughs> So, you know, Alan Akebourne has written some wonderful uh, comedies, but he couldn't have made that up. And the, my last question, while um, everybody's thinking of their questions, is um, just been through the new succession. Um, Rufus Norris will take over from Nicholas Heitner. Um, and I'm sure he will come to you and <laughs> talk to you because you know everything. Um, what do you feel... Uh, the opportunities, if you like, for Rufus. It's been so successful under Nick Heitner, uh, the, the, both you know, the box office, the bums on seats, everything about it. Um, but what do you think the future might hold? You know, we, we talk about this in Chichester, you know, the, the mm. first 50 years and the next 50 years. So, so what would I'm, you say? I'm not by, by sort of cowardice or caution or fence sitting. I don't feel it's appropriate for me to tell Rufus, Rufus Norris what to programme in his opening season. That's why he's Rufus Norris and I'm me. That's why you and your colleagues appointed him. What I feel about The National is that he will inherit something extraordinary in terms of having an incredibly solid foundation on which to build. It might seem silly to talk about foundations with an organisation that's 50 years old, but every new artistic director of every producing theatre starts from a foundation of their own tenure. So the point about the timing of, of Rufus Norris taking over in 2015 is that if everything's on schedule, NT Future, the redevelopment of the building, will have finished. So he will have um, a new perspective on what the studio theatre, the Dorfman, Cottesloe as was, can do. And maybe the kind of more experimental programming of, of that space will be possible, will be encouraged. He's also inheriting a change in the National Theatre audience. I have a chapter towards the end of the book which I call The Tipping Point. Something has happened to the National in terms of consistency of high audience figures, large houses, in the Littleton and Olivier, which is unprecedented. I, I am a cricket nut, and I have applied, in a sense, some, 
statistical analysis of the national's history borrowed from cricket, which is looking at the averages, the batting averages in cricket, <laughs> the average attendance, how full was the house? Was it 85% full? Was it 70% full? 100%. And the figures for the uh, 10 and counting years under Nick Heitner and Nick Starr are unbelievably consistent. And the starting point for that was the Travel X 10 pounds tickets, now 12 pounds. But some kind of a virtuous circle was created where people kept coming on a regular basis such that something which had plagued the national periodically all the way through from 76 to 2003 was just occasionally a show would play to 35% audience or 40% audience and the break-even figure for budgeting is 65%. I'm sorry to suddenly throw all these percentages out there, but they're so important to the success of the organization. As here, you budget for a certain number of, of an audience, and if it falls below that, you have a shortfall to make up. So Rufus Norris is in a position where if he can sustain that momentum, there is a, an expanded, revitalized, dedicated, and engaged core audience for the national that did not exist a few years ago. Mm. And I think I'm an optimist about theatre in general in this web whatever number point oh we're on to, the multimedia age, everybody surgically attached under the age of 30 to their smartphone. Yes, but all of that is, is audiovisual. It's 2D, you know, whether it's your laptop, your smartphone, your home cinema, it's not being with 300 other people watching Frank Langella this evening. The liveness of theatre, you know, all kinds of things were supposed to kill theatre off. Cinema was supposed to kill off theatre. TV was supposed to kill off cinema and theatre. And here, here we still are. So I think the optimism should be quite high for theatre if the, the ticket pricing can be kept at the right level. Mm. And, you know, the, which is why banging the drum for uh, adequate government subsidy to be restored is so important. You know, that, is, that isn't about being political. That's about um, supporting the, the performing mm. arts. Mm. And possibly that when you come to write the next instalment, yeah. maybe slightly wider um, number of women's names in there. It's quite a, a male story, it now, is, isn't it? It is quite a male story. And Peter Hall came under fire for that in the 1980s, that there were no women in his, in his directorial team. It got the proportion became significantly higher under Richard Eyre, and there have been a significant number of women directors uh, uh, under Nick Heitner. But, as, as Kate knows well, you know, this notion of the woman novelist, the woman, the woman director, it's a very complicated um, argument. It, you know, should and you're it, a male biographer. Exactly. After all. <laughs> should it ultimately just be novelist, playwright, director? And then... Can we have the house lights up a bit so I can see that there are people out there? Thank you. Now, does anybody have a question they would like to ask Daniel? Greg. Uh, if we didn't have a national theatre, and hadn't had one for the past 50 years, we just had the National Theatre Act 1949, what do you think we might have ended up with as a kind of national theatre? M <coughs> meaning, would we... Would we have gone for a building that's in London? Ah. Would we have gone for a theatre? Yes, in well... Would we have ended Thanks, up Greg. like the National Theatre of Scotland? You know, this model of do, do, we, need, do we need the building? Would the, the millions that go on the upkeep of the building have gone on uh, new plays that were left unwritten, larger cast revivals of Shakespeare that were left un, unstaged? Um, we'd have had a very uh, impoverished New York theatre because we have, the National has been, has been pushing uh, original plays onto Broadway. Uh, for, for, for decades. It's a, it's, a, it's a fascinating question. Do you have to have a base? Um, it is a rallying point. You know, the, and Granville Barker saw this, and it's not a um, de haut en bas. It's not, it's not from the great metropolis allowing plays to trickle out to the regions. There is something about the national as a, as a focal point and the attention it gets and the standards that it's funding and it's building allow it to achieve and to maintain that, that trickles outward positively. You know, one of the things, there are many things I didn't have time or scope for in the book, and I may, I hope, go back to it, but it would be fascinating to draw a diaspora map 
of British theatre with lines from the National and the RSC out to the regional theatres to see where people who worked at the National, you know, Giles Croft running Nottingham had been literary manager um, at the National. Um, you know, Daniel Evans working as an actor at the National was a big part of his becoming artistic director. At, at Sheffield, and when he's artistic director at Sheffield, one of the things he does is he programs a David Hare season and a Michael Frayne season, which means that people in Sheffield who perhaps didn't get down to London to see those plays see them. So the notion of this, some people would, would argue vehemently against me on this, that um, there used to be a clause, um, sorry, there used to be a statement used by playwrights' agents which they would say, Play X, premiered at the, Na at the National, is now available for repertory revival. And that the, the regional artistic directors would find this terribly patronizing. Another way of looking at it is, you've got the National, which allows it to put on ambitious, perhaps contentious plays. They, if they are well received, but with the finite audience for a run at the National, two or three th years later, um, Sheffield does it, or, or Plymouth does it, and a regional audience which, which cannot afford, in time or money terms, a, a, an overnight stay to see it in London, gets to see it. Now, NT Live changes that, the cinema broadcasts changes that, but it doesn't completely change it because it isn't, NT Live is not suitable for every show in the season. And, and it's wonderful that these, the, the plays, you know, Granville Barker and the uh, Shakespeare Memorial National Theatre Committee movement in the 1900s, they felt that one of their key goals was to prevent plays of, recent plays of great merit from falling into oblivion. Hmm. And that's what the regional, which is why the threat, and Nicholas Heitner has been as passionate an advocate for this as anybody, the threat of individual smaller provincial theatres closing because that they don't, they aren't able to um, perhaps generate as much private funding as a high-profile London theatre. Um, you know, the National is changing. The National is, has become so much more open to um, other theatre practitioners, and the changes in the building will allow that, this notion that you can go and work at the National even if you're not working on a National Theatre show. The work of the National Theatre Studio, which we have Sir Peter Hall, you know, to thank for. You know, the umpteen you could, you could draw a, up a list of umpteen productions in London and elsewhere. Death and the Maiden, the astonishing Ariel Dorfman play done at the Royal Court, had been developed at the National Theatre Studio. So, so very often something might have a, a National Theatre imprint on it that we outside of the profession don't know about. Mm. It's also the affection for a place where people come back and see people they know. Yeah. Is there another question? Gentleman there. Could you tell us a little bit um, about what we didn't see on the television the other night during those astonishing celebrations on uh, November the 2nd? Was there any uh, moments which stuck in both your minds, actually, because yeah. I imagine you two were there, uh, yes, I will. <laughs> that uh, you'd like us to hear about? Uh, at the gala itself? Yeah, great gala. Well, the only, the, as far as I'm aware, the only thing not televised was Nicholas Heitner's speech to the audience at, at the start to kind of tell us how the evening would work, which was, you know, an amazing speech. It was just very warm. It was beautifully judged in paying tribute to all of the people who had made the National Theatre um, what it is. He, he itemised who was here, the chairman of the board, who was there, the playwrights that were there, um, and the... It was an extraordinarily moving, I mean, for me, it was, it was like seeing, in a sense, an animated version of the book. It really was very strange for me to, to see it like that. And, um, and the fact that they emphasized so many of the new plays, you know, it, I do feel that is, that is where the national, to come back to this gentleman's question earlier, the national, we would have had a very impoverished new writing environment without the national. You know, the mm. scale and scope and daring of the new plays that are put on there and the number of productions that those plays have internationally. So, you know, it will be very interesting. The, the gala is going to be broadcast by PBS, the public broadcaster in America. 
in the middle of February next year. And it'll be very interesting mm, to, to see, see how audiences react to that, how critics react to that, whether they will feel a disconnect or whether there will be this thing which, you know, I'd rather like the idea of the surprise that I've encountered from people when, when, when they, if they know Amadeus, the film, and I say, well, you know it started at the National Theatre, and they go, really? <laughs> or I have students, and we study closer, Patrick Marber's play, and they know the film. They say, well, you know it was a play at the National Theatre, and they go, really? Yes. You know, no, but that's, 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 that's the equivalent as well, isn't it? You know, the film of Emma saying, based on a novel by, you go. Um, I, th I think one of the things that was really wonderful, and it fits into Greg's question, and, and will be, I think, maybe the place that we will finish was about the gala on the Saturday night. There had been an, a, a paying audience on the Friday, which was very glitzy. The audience on Saturday night were people who worked there, mostly. And at the very end, uh, the curtain call people came on in reverse order. So those who are working here, there now came on first and right up to the people who've been part of the Olivier company, some of them from here. Um, and then after that, the crew all came out and waved to their friends in the audience. And that, for me, was it. Mm. That actually, the building is the sum of the people in it, actually. And that's why we love Chichester as well. Mm. It's all the people that have played their part, and I think there was that sense as well. Yeah. And I'm not going to let you speak anymore, I'm okay. afraid, because I'm very aware um, that we must give this playhouse back to the, the players. Yes. As always, um, it belongs to the players. Um, I'd like to say an enormous thank you before I finish to the stage management here in the Minerva and the front of house staff that over the course of the whole long season and this little out of season, have made it possible for us to do pre-performance, post-performance, page-to-stage talks, um, and celebrate everything else that goes in behind the scenes of the theatre. But it's, uh, it's difficult for you guys. So a big thank you to all of you here. I'm not sure how many of you actually are here. Um, I'd also, of course, mostly like to say an enormous thank you to Rupert Robotham, who's head of learning and participation and everything, indeed, who has programmed all of this. And this is the last chance to say that. And many of you have been to every single talk, I know, because I recognise you all. Um, and that makes an enormous difference. And I think it's very appropriate, Daniel, that you should be the last of these pre-performance talks um, to celebrate this incredible book. Um, I know many of you will think this is rather big to take home and it will be on your Christmas list. But if you buy it tonight, Daniel can sign it for you. And just think what a much better present that will be. Um, but it seems appropriate that we celebrated the 50th anniversary of Chichester on this stage. We are delighted that you've come and chosen here to celebrate the publication of this. Um, I know it's going to be an enormously important book, but it is a wonderful read. So, ladies and gentlemen, Daniel Rosenthal. Daniel, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much.